Hey everybody, let's talk about small countries in Victoria 3. One of the favorite things I have in, in this game is where I take a small country like the Kingdom of Prussia and make it grow into something much larger. You may be thinking, well, how is Kingdom of Prussia small? It's the smallest of the great powers. You got that. But you may be thinking, I want a smaller, smaller country. Fair enough. Well, let's take a look. There are some countries that have potential to grow. Uh, Sardinia Piedmont, for example, that can grow into Italy. It's not as big as Germany, but still a fun path to go on. You can also look at Brazil, Mexico, Persia, Egypt, Japan. These are nations that make a lot of stuff internally. Now, they're small in terms of power, but not in terms of population or area. And because they have a significant population and a significant area that is uh, resource diverse, they're able to remain outside of other nations' uh, trade markets, which is good. And they also have enough population that they can build out their universities, maximize their technology uh, every turn, and then increase their capability to industrialize further. Whereas a smaller nation, you simply can't build enough universities and staff them all and still also industrialize. You, you, you make a trade-off there. Uh, I, I tried as Greece to do all these things, and very quickly, within 12 years, I had zero peasants, zero unemployed, nobody looking for another job, and certainly not a job in a university. They wanted a, a much higher paying job in a, a luxury factory. And, that, that, and Greece is a nice comparison to Sardinia Piedmont. Both look about the same in terms of area, but Greece has got less than 1 million population. Sardinia Piedmont has got about 3.5 million population. There's a clear difference between the two. Sardinia Piedmont having more people in it and also more technology puts it further ahead. If the challenge you're looking for is to be a nation that is small in terms of power, but that can build enough to eventually project itself to become a much larger force, to actually take the stage as a great nation, you do want to have a nation that has a significant population and significant resources. This is an age of corporatism incorporating nations, bringing things together. So if you start off very small, like a, a micro nation in Germany, the, your neighbors are wanting to acquire you. You're, you're not going to be able to research technology as fast as anybody else that's bigger. Your army is tiny. And the, well, frankly, the infamy penalty for knocking you over is also very tiny. So yeah, good luck with that. I mean, now there's some people who say, oh, I want to have a big challenge. Well, you know who you are, and you've played this game enough where you're ready to go into that. If you're just starting out in Victoria 3 and say, I want to do a small nation. Yeah, the mouse is that roars. Woo! Don't pick a nation that is too small, or you're going to be very bored. Why, why is nothing happening? Nothing's happening because your nation is too small to do anything except build very slowly and wait to be part of a, some, large, some larger market. And again, we don't have a lot of uh, historical flavor. So if you're planning to be Greece and, uh, you know, reform the Byzantine Empire is part of the, you know, Megali idea, uh, it's not happening. Not now. You, you, if you cheat, you could do it. But at the same time, I'll just say this. You may think it's wonderful to reform Greece. Keep in mind that Russia was adamant against Greece being that big. They did not want a Byzantine Empire. They had enough trouble with the Ottoman Empire. They did not want a revitalized Greek nation blocking their path to the Mediterranean. I think if we add local color to allow nations to expand, we need to also add the color and the flavor for larger nations to come smashing in. Same story with Scandinavia. We can form Scandinavia in the game. Go Denmark or Sweden or Norway. If you're playing as Finland and you form Scandinavia, wow, that's some amazing work there. 
But all the same, Russia did not want Scandinavia to form. Prussia did not want it. And by extension, a unified Germany would not want a unified Scandinavia. And England didn't want that either. So we should have something where if you're trying to form Scandinavia, those three powers are trying to throttle you. And maybe what you have to do is leverage Austria and or France to get your Scandinavia to form. It's all part of the balance of power. But I digress. Those are not options right now. And it's not an option for Greece or Serbia or Montenegro to really grow. Romania can grow. And if you're saying, what? Isn't that Romania? I've People who live there call it Romania. So I'm going to call it Romania. It's just because they're Roman. Yeah. <laughs> but Romania can grow. There, there's, there's mechanics for that. But Serbia and the other Balkans... It's not there yet, so I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, mm. if you want to, again, if you want to be small and stay small, get joined into a market and play the diplomatic game so you don't get eaten up, go for it. And in fact, that is what a small nation has to do in Victoria 3. It's got to play the economic game by getting into somebody else's market if it's too small to satisfy its own needs. And it must play the diplomatic game to prevent itself from being conquered. Find, make, create allies elsewhere. But you get the same benefits by going with a slightly larger small nation and you don't have to be as beholden to a great power. For example, Mexico. Uh, when I played as Mexico, I made an alliance with England, but I didn't have to be part of their market. The Mexican market stayed independent and after a, a huge war with the USA, we were able to keep all of our northern territory Thank you, Britain, for being part of our army there and was able to continue industrializing. It, it wasn't as fast in the, as the, the, on the industrialization as it was for some of the great powers, but it was. I was able to do it. And because I kept the northern territories, I was able to enjoy the gold mines in California, Nevada, and Arizona and have that boost the economy. But what made Mexico fun was that there were still things happening internally. It, the political game, the domestic political game for a more advanced nation is going to be more enjoyable. There, there are more options to do. If you're starting off with very low technology, you have to wait to develop certain technologies before your government can change, before your people will start to demand things that will lead to changes. You, you have to wait for that in a developing economy. Starting off as Japan, uh, yeah, I spent a long time just waiting for buildings to build, and then they started to snowball. We started to get more technology to help them grow faster, and we built more resources to get them going. And Japan's very difficult because it is isolationist, so it must provide everything for itself. That's a very interesting challenge, and I, I do enjoy that. And I would like it to be where we have more color for Japan to really flesh out that experience. It, it is a satisfying one, but you must be patient at the beginning. There is lots to not do for a lesser advanced uh, small nation in this game. If we look at Russia, it, it, it's got problems with its own technology, and so does the Ottoman Empire, but there's lots going on. Because they are major powers, they are sending out diplomats to arrange things. They're looking at the, these other little nations that, that they could sphere and conquer. Ottomans would love to get back this chunk of Egypt and subjugate the Kedivate. Uh, you know, there, there's plenty to do for those guys while you're waiting for your technology to build up. If you're a small nation and you don't have a big army and you're just waiting for your technology to improve, you, you have a lot of waiting to do. This covers the experience right now. I, I, I wish it was more than that. I wish I could say the, such a nation has got this great uh, path that it can follow because of the events that are there. Uh, Sardinia Piedmont does get a, a good path because it's part of Italian unification. I'll give it that. But the others really don't have a lot going on for them. It, it, you're not going to see much difference between playing, uh, say, the Kievan Khanate and the Emirate of Bukhara right now. 
This will probably change in 1.7 because it does bring in the great, excuse me, brings in the great gain, which specifically for this region of the world is going to change some things. But even then, uh, being like the the the, the Khedivate of Egypt, that's that's going to be a richer set of options that you have throughout the game than say if you play uh, the, the Sokoto Caliphate or the Sultanate of Morocco. Uh, you're you're kind of limited there, and with Morocco, you're going to wind up being picked on by the French because they get the ability to claim your territory and win you over in a return state. That that's, that's a very difficult scenario to face. And I don't really find it entertaining because there's so much waiting in between. I'd rather be the larger nation that picks up the smaller one and makes it part of its sphere, which is why I look forward to the next DLC, the Sphere of Influence one. Right now, I kind of have to conquer it or force it to be my protectorate, and I would much rather just to roll out the Velvet Empire, which is what the French were. They were able to take over chunks of the world without firing a shot. I want to do that. Now, having gone through all that, if you're determined, absolutely determined to play a small nation and keep it small, maybe have a few colonies, but you're going to keep the nation small, I got I have a really good pick, and it's a very interesting nation, Belgium. Why is Belgium interesting? Well, England was the first big industrial nation of Europe. Belgium was the second, and it wasn't all of Belgium. It was the southern part, Wallonia. And even more interesting is that uh, there, there, there had been for some time a, a theory or a view that Northwestern Europe industrialized first and best because they were driven by the Protestant work ethic, which is pretty much propaganda for Protestants and work ethicers. But Belgium was not Protestant, especially the part that industrialized Wallonia. It was Catholic. And if there are people saying, well, the Germanic people were like the British. And okay, it's a stretch to call the British Germanic after all the intermingling that they've done with everything else out there. But people are going, oh, the Germanic people were best at industrializing. Uh, the, the Belgians aren't Germanic. They're, the, especially in southern Belgium, they're more French than German. And you may think, well, but there's this little tiny bit of Belgium that's German-speaking. Yeah, because they grabbed it from Germany in 1919. It's not really Belgium. It's the French stuff. That's that's Belgium there. What about the Flemish? Well, that's that's Flanders. That That's different. In fact, the Kingdom of Netherlands didn't industrialize the same way that the rest of Europe did because it had already peaked, so to speak, much of its wealth was derived from organic resources, whereas Britain was deriving its wealth from mineral resources. And that's where Belgium was also getting its wealth. Instead of using wood for fuel, they were using coal for fuel. That's industrialization. When you're using coal, which is a more efficient fuel for your lighting and heating, as you build out steel that is made with the iron and the coal, there's, there's, there's some very interesting dynamics there. And, and, and we, we can see these in other locations in Europe as well. But Belgium has got these things. Belgium has got resource richness, even though it only has the two uh, provinces. It's very rich in that. And you can take that industrialization of Belgium and really run with it. It's a fun way to learn the economy of the game because you don't have a lot to mess with. Just again, just those two. And if you're not trying to become a massive colonial power, all you have to do is Belgium is mind your market. If you want, you can join another market, but you don't have to. And make sure your diplomatic relationships with France and Prussia and England are kept in balance and that you're always able to have an alliance with at least two of them. Because if you have a defensive alliance, they won't attack you. And if you have a defensive alliance with at least two of them, that means the third will think twice before it tangles with two great powers over a few provinces here in northwestern Europe. If you're looking for a small nation, 
there's lots to choose from. Small in power and small in technology is not the same as small in area and population. You want to get bigger? Japan, Mexico, Sardinia, Brazil, Persia, Egypt, great candidates. You want to stay small but be productive and have lots of things to do? I'd go with Belgium. Because again, they're more technologically advanced, so they have more political options at the beginning of the game. The rest of it, plan on waiting till at least 1860 to 1870 before you have lots to do, or comparatively lots to do. It's still not going to be a full-fledged Victoria 3 game, but it can be a kind of a peaceful thing, something where you're doing a little bit of clicking on the game while you're watching a video somewhere else, things like that. But this is my advice on playing a small nation. Don't just start clicking and trying to maximize it and trying to make it as big as possible. Do some research on it. Read about the history of that place. And not, not, and not just a Wikipedia article. See if you can find a book on it. And as you read things, see if that's reflected in your game. See if what you experience in the game mirrors the history or has something that connects to it then you get a richer experience from it you don't just play the game you learn along with the game i find that i really enjoy preparing for these videos by reading lots of other things and then i can go oh but wait yeah this is this is cool which is why i need to reshoot my let's play video series as i've read some more and I'm kind of uncomfortable with the way a, a turn went, and I want to start over from that save and do things a little bit differently there. It's it's just how it has to happen. That This is a game where you don't feel bad if you go back to an earlier save and try something different and then compare the two saves and pick the one that's better. This is okay. This is a learning experience. Immerse yourself in the history and the economics and other information of the time find out more about that nation you want to play and don't just assume you know everything about it because you grew up there or because you know somebody from there or you once read a book about it in high school or read more there's lots of new research that's being done find out what needs to be updated in your old stack of knowledge and get into it learn more so when I do in more of these videos, you can tell me things like, well, when I did my Persia run, I found out that da ba da ba da ding da da, and I'll go, oh, I'm amazed, especially if I do a Persia run and you school me on it because I didn't read as much as you did. I would love for that to happen. That's the best thing. But absolutely, get into the game. A small nation can be where you learn the mechanics, but it's also where you can learn the history. And I hope you go off and do that. May all your diplomatic plays go the way you want, and may you find the right resources online to give you more information to play your game. Until next time, I'll start playing my other thing. <laughs> we'll see you. Bye.